Well, actually, um, we will not be concluding our series. We're actually preempting the close of our series, and we'll actually do it in the latter part of the month. But because of what we were facing as an island and as a state, the two storms, and Pastor Norman and our leadership team, we felt it just it, to insert a prophetic series instead of closing out the last series on destiny, but to insert a prophetic series because we are facing unprecedented times. The two storms that God kind of allowed for us to, as a church and as a state, to awaken in prayer. And again, as Pastor Billy said, thank you for praying. I knew that the saints in Hawaii were praying and different other parts of the world were praying. And many people think, well, those storms that turned away, it was just happenstance. It was Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. No, it was not, baby. It was the hand of God that turned the storm. And so turn, turn yeah, come on, give God praise. And I firmly believe that the prayers of the saints can do miraculous things. And I always say, well, this is how you test it. Maybe the next storm, don't pray. Just stand at Ala Moana Beach and say, come on, hurricane. No, what an idiotic thought that would be. But I tell you, when we come together in prayer, God hears from heaven. And he says, there's my people, there's my sons and daughters calling upon me. And because of their prayers, I am going to intervene and turn this storm away. Amen? Amen. God overall is our new series for the next three weeks. And I believe it's a prophetic series because we are, as I said, I can't even say the word already. I'm so excited. We have elections coming up. Next week is the 15th anniversary of 9-11, how that changed the landscape of the world. I asked this question in the earlier service and even last night when I preached. I said, how many have you been to the airport recently? Honolulu, Honolulu International Airport recently. Can, do you remember the days when we actually could go with our family and friends all the way up to the gate? No security, just walk right in, bust out our zip packs our L and L bentos right at the gate, gather in a circle, play our ukuleles and guitars, and have a grand old party at the gate. I miss those times. But because of what transpired on 9-11, guess what? That freedom is now gone. And you have to, unless you have a ticket, you can't get past security. In a couple of weeks, I'm about to go through security at the Honolulu International Airport to go to Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, some of you are from Louisville, Kentucky. Are you excited to see me leave? I don't know how to take that. Either you're from, <laughs> either you're from Louisville or, you, or you, you're glad to see me go. I don't know how to take that. All right, all right. I, I believe that. All right. You, you're from Louisville, Kentucky, so that's why you, you rejoiced. But there are storms that hit all of us in our lives. It might be not just beyond just a natural storm. There might be these storms that hit your health, that hit your relationships, that hit your, your, your family, your friends. And these storms come, uh, come unexpectedly. None of us plan to have storms in our life. Storms and squalls that come up on the horizon of life come unexpectedly. And most times they come at the wrong time of life. And most times when they come, it's just not one or two storms. It's multiple storms, perfect storms that come against our life. And I believe that as we enter into this prophetic series, that we believe that the Holy Spirit would speak to us. That storms that come against us, sometimes God allows these storms to develop us. Last week, Saturday night, Pastor Coach preached an excellent message on the life of Jonah and how that storm was there to develop Jonah's character, but also redirect Jonah's life to be back on purpose to fulfilling the destiny that God had called him for such a time when he was on the planet Earth. But sometimes there are storms that come against us that are demonically sent Storms that will delay us, storms that will distract us, and storms that will destroy us. Because there is a real enemy out there that wants to steal, kill, and destroy your destiny. There's a real enemy that wants to steal, and kill, steal, and destroy your relationships, your affection to the Lord. And the scripture says, even in the book of Job, there is where God gives the enemy, Satan, the ability to control the weather to destroy Job's affection for God toward God. So trust me, there is a real enemy that wants to steal and kill and destroy your life. And as I look at this natural storm that we pray away supernaturally, all of us are facing storms in our life. Maybe, maybe this morning you might be facing a storm even right now. 
You're sitting in these comfortable seats, enjoying the AC outside, inside, away from the humidity. And when the, when the worship leader goes, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, we go, fight, 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 yeah, God. But as soon as we leave this place, all of a sudden that storm starts to brew again. The burden of, of, of what we're facing starts to come upon our shoulders. But this morning, I'm hoping that through the word of God that we would move from fear to faith. That we would see the storms that God allows into our life to develop our faith, to develop our character. So that we would turn our focus to him. Can I hear an amen this morning? Scripture says in Matthew chapter 8, and let me give you the backdrop of this story. In Matthew chapter 8, the disciples and Jesus had an intense time of ministry. Jesus just came out of teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. A great sermon. And then all of a sudden, he started, he started to heal the sick, started to cast out demons. And so he decided to take his disciples across to the other side, a time of refreshing, a time of, of prayer, a time of reflecting on the season of ministry they just came out of. And so they were on this boat crossing the Sea of Galilee. So we pick it up in verse 23 of Matthew 8. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm. Somebody say great storm. Great storm storm on the sea. So that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. How many of you have ever felt that when you're walking through a storm or difficult season of life, and you've been praying that sometimes you feel like Jesus is asleep? Only me? <laughs> there are times and sometimes I feel like I'm praying and I'm calling upon God and I'm just going, cricket, cricket, cricket. Jesus, are you out there? Are you listening? And sometimes in life we feel like Jesus is asleep. But here he was, asleep in the boat. And they went and woke him saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. From a great storm to a great calm. Can we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that your presence being established in worship because you said you inhabit the praises of your people. And I thank you, Lord, that even through this word and through this time, I pray beyond just a Logos word, I pray that there will be a rhema deposit of your spirit speaking to our hearts that, Lord, if we are currently in the storm, that we would, be, we would walk through this storm and storms of life with faith. And, Lord, when the storms of life come against us in another season of life, we will be people that will walk in faith, walk in the victory that you give us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Encourage our hearts here as we focus on you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. do me a quick favor. Turn to your neighbor next to you. I haven't done this for months, but I did it last night, and it was great to bring it back just for a moment. Turn and smile at your neighbor, and I'm the only pastor that does this, so sorry, baby. It's me this morning. Lock the doors. Turn to your neighbor, smile. Okay, I promise we won't do this too many times today unless you start falling asleep. They will tell you, like Pastor Norman tells you, to slap your neighbor. I don't go that far. (laughs) But turn to your neighbor and smile and say, you look good this morning. (laughs) Reason why I say that, because when Jesus Christ comes into our life, this is not part of the message, this is for free. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, he transforms you so that the burdens of life won't cave you in. And so out of that transformation, we should become people of joy. And when we exude the presence of God around us, our countenance and our manners change. Amen? Turn to your neighbor once again and tell him, you look really good. Okay, don't be weird about it, okay? <laughs> don't be awkward about it. Ooh, you look really good. Okay, come on. <laughs> don't be weird. All right. But God is good, and he wants us to, 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 to bless us well. The disciples in this moment, a unique moment, they were seasoned fishermen. Several of them, that was their lifestyle. So these storms that they face in life on the sea, it was not unique. It was not foreign to them. They knew what storms were. They knew how to navigate. They knew what sails to put up, what sails to put down. They knew what currents and how to navigate the sea. But here, this particular storm was a great storm. It's something that they had never seen before in their life. Seasoned fishermen. How many love, love to fish? And how many like to go out on a boat? Okay, less hands. I don't like to go on the boat because I get seasick. The last time I was in the boat was a 19-footer. 
with seven of us on a 19 footer that never works the boat started to sink and I got seasick and we're out on Waianae coast and trust me I wanted to, to go back I won't tell you what happened, what I did, but trust me, it was a scary moment. I got to be seasick. But here the disciples were afraid. They saw, and they were in the midst of a great storm that they have never faced before. And instead of being people of faith, or disciples of faith, because Jesus was in their boat, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the person that they just saw perform great miracles, healing the sick, casting out demons, Jesus was in their boat. But yet, they were afraid. And so they called out to Jesus, Jesus! Hello, Jesus, why are you asleep? And Jesus got up and questioned. He questioned their fear. He questioned their fear. Why are you afraid? Am I not here with you? Am I, did I not just perform miracles in front of your eyes? Why are you afraid in the midst of this storm? Sometimes we, when we face storms, we forget that Jesus is in our boat in our life, in our heart. Sometimes when we face the squalls of life that presses in, we forget and we tend to focus on the storm when Jesus is saying, focus on me. Know that I am there for you. Know that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so in the moment, the master, the teacher rebuked his disciples. Why are you, why you have little faith? Don't you know that I'm there? I'll be there to protect you. I'll be there to provide for you. I'll be there to heal you. I will be there. My presence will be with you. They were afraid. They were fearful. Jesus expected his disciples to activate an existing inner faith. There was in them a measure of faith. Because when they came to Christ, a measure of grace and faith was put into their hearts. They saw Jesus perform miracles. Miracle after miracle after miracle. So, so there should have been a faith that would come out of their life no matter the circumstance around them. They knew that Jesus was present. And Jesus was calling on them. That inner faith in your soul, in your heart, in your life should come to fruition. Should come and activate you should have an activation of faith when you face storms. But here the disciples, Jesus right in their boat, became not people of faith. They became people of fear. And I hope that's not you. Tell the person next to you, that's not you. You're full of faith this morning. The disciples lost the sight of the reality of the power and presence of Jesus. They lost sight of the reality of the power and presence of Jesus. Jesus was right there. But yet... He wasn't really sleeping. I'm sure this is Jesus, a moment that he wanted to train and equip his disciples. I'm sure Jesus was kind of peeking. Yeah. Even though the disciples were rocking, oh, Lord. The storm was coming and the, dr and, 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 and the boat was, they were drowning in the boat. The boat was sinking. And I'm sure Jesus was fast asleep, just looking. All right. I'm wondering when the disciples will call upon me. I'm wondering when they will activate their faith and trust in me. And in a moment, instead of being people of faith, they were people of fear. He questioned their fear, but expected their faith. He expected faith. He expects faith from us. In the midst of storms that we face, he expects faith from us. But there are us. There must be some things that we must equip ourselves with and things that we must do to be people of faith. First of all, we must turn fear into prayer. Turn your fear into prayer. Yes, there's a reality that we face. And when storms come unexpectedly, there are countless times when people have come or prayer requests have come and prayer requests are text to us and our staff and, and, and people who go to the doctor, all of a sudden the storm of a health issue comes out of nowhere. They're healthy. Their blood work is great. And all of a sudden, they go to the doctor because they're feeling a little uneasy. Something's going on. They're feeling tired. And, they, and we, we see this text time and time and time and time again. The doctor just gave me a pronouncement of death. The doctor just said, I have diabetes. I have heart problems. I have cancer. I have this. And my heart breaks for those moments when people send us those prayer requests. But my, my encouragement to them is in this moment, Turn your fear into faith. Turn your fear into prayer. The first person that you should talk to, the first person that you should connect to is with God himself. Sometimes when the storms come, all of a sudden out of the horizon, they come against us. What do we do? We turn to other people. We turn to other things 
to medicate ourselves, to, 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 to remove this, this, this fear from our lives. No, God is saying, turn to me. Turn to me. The first person that you should turn to when you are facing a storm is to Jesus in prayer. And then your spouses and your family and your, and your grace group people to pray and support with you. But most times when, we, when, we, when we're faced with a storm in life, guess what we do? Guess who we turn to? Mr. Google. How can I defeat this by myself? How can I, how can I get all the medical understanding of what I'm facing? No! Google is not more powerful than God. We turn to God. We get on our knees in prayer. We, we bend our knees in prayer. Scripture says in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Yes, God knows your heart, but he wants to hear it from your mouth. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A spirit of fear is not from him, but a spirit of faith is from him. Not fear, but faith. Use fear to trigger prayer. Use fear to trigger prayer. Yes, is the reality that you're facing. I get it. I empathize. I understand. There is that. But turn that fear into supplication. Turn that, pr turn that fear into prayer. There should be carpet marks and carpet skids on your knees. The tears should be staining the carpet fibers when you're praying. And I say this, and I want to encourage you. It takes more than drive-by prayers. Sometimes when we face storms, we think a little, a little prayer here, a little prayer there, a little prayer here, a little prayer at night, a little prayer before I go to bed will work. No, it does not. When the storms of life press you in, it takes constant prayer. And I call this persevering prayer. Persevering prayer. There are times when there, you need to take seasons of prayer, not just a season of prayer but seasons of prayer, to call upon him, to, to, to cry out to him. And sometimes when we, 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 tend, we cut short the blessing of God because we tend to just do drive-by prayers. Okay, God, heal me. If it be your will, if you're a sovereign God, if you heal me, great. If not, oh, well. No. Contend. Contend in faith persevere in prayer for some of you the breakthrough that you've been calling out for you've been you've been you've been praying to god for your healing for your marriage for your relationships for your kids for your job contend in prayer persevere in prayer and don't give up turn to the person next to you don't give up don't give up but it takes extended moments of prayer and i love this the scripture says it must be accompanied with thanksgiving it must be accompanied with thanksgiving Yes, God understands what you're going through. And yes, there's a moment when, God, I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm angry at you for putting me in this situation. He gets that. You can say that for a moment, but don't stay there. Start thanking him. Lord, you called me to be your son and daughter. You said in your word, I will face storms. And, and thank you, Lord, for this storm. I don't like it that I'm in this storm. But in this season, you put me in this storm. So, Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit being with me through the storm. How many like to be around people that are always complaining and, and, and negative around you? Right? They're complaining about the weather. They're complaining about food. They're complaining about their spouse, about their kids, about their boss. Our staff does not complain about me. <laughs> At least not that I know of, all right? And we complain about this and that and this and that. I'm like, how many? I, I can't stand that. I can avoid you. So if I'm avoiding you, don't get offended, all right? Just throwing it out there. But we love to be around positive people, people who are thankful. Even in the midst, of, you know they're walking through a difficult moment. Even though maybe they're walking through a divorce right now, yet they're so thankful. Even in the midst of their pain, they're thankful. They're thankful that God is with them. Yet when their sons and daughters are going wayward, they, just, they still thank God for having their kids in their life. And they thank him in advance for his spirit to encounter their heart. Start to be people of thankfulness. Pray, supplicate, but be thankful. The word supplication is this, a really big long word, but I, I'm going to break it down. It's real simple. It's just a personal request to God. That's all it is. 
Supplication is just a personal request. Sometimes we pray and we petition for many other people and many other things. That's petition of prayer. But supplication of prayer is just, God, I have this prayer request. I have this need, Lord. I need you. And Lord, I'm thankful. Even in the midst of this storm, I thank you that you are God over all. And when that happens, your perspective of life changes. The atmosphere of your life and your heart and your mind changes. Trust me, we like to be around positive people. But when they're girded up with the presence of God, it takes it to a whole new level. And I love being around people who are just, even in the midst of difficult moments, they encourage themselves and they encourage me. I get blessed by that. And I'm hoping that we would be people of faith, that even in the midst of storms, we would be people of thankfulness. Can I hear amen? And then the Bible says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which can't be explained in humanistic or logical approaches or ways. How many of you have been around people when you know they're walking through some difficult moments, yet they seem so calm? They seem so joyful. He just can't quite get it. Man. You, 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 you just got a death sentence from your doctor, and yet there's just such a peace about you, believing that you're going to get healed. I, mean, I, I, I get astounded at times logically. Like, how can they be peaceful in the midst of a storm? But that's because they had the presence of God. It guards both your hearts and your minds. It guards your emotions and your thoughts. Because when we face storms, sometimes our emotions go all over the place. Woo, we get stressed out, and then we get other people around us stressed out. And we start to just, just vent on other people around us, and, and they get all emotional with you. The peace of God guards your emotions. It, 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 it gets you from being out of control to being in control, because God is in control. That's what happens when the peace of God guards your heart. It guards your emotions, and it guards your thoughts. Because what happens when we focus in prayer, and we focus on the Lord, that which we think of will affect our emotions and our heart. And when our heart is affected, it will affect our hands and our application of faith in our life. Can I hear amen? amen. Next, we need to focus our thoughts. And I am almost done. I preached short last night, baby. It might be a miracle this morning. I hear some of you praying already. <laughs> Scripture says in verse 8 of Philippians 4, Finally, brothers, in the original Greek text, Paul is writing this word. The word finally is interpreted as, Guys, from now on, from now on, from this moment, from, oh, that's a little, I was at a wedding last night and it was all lovey-dovey. I'm like, ooh, guess what, Mitch and Hannah, wait till you face your storm, baby. An evil thought. <laughs> Mitch and Hannah, you watching this? I'm, I apologize. That was uncalled for. <laughs> but when those storms come into your marriage, you're on the honeymoon, you're on cloud nine now. But when the storms come, the Bible says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence or if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Ponder. Pause. Instead of looking at the storm and complaining and being negative, pause. Hit the pause button of life. Turn to God in prayer and start to think about the pure things. Start to think about His goodness. Start to think about His grace. Start to think about His love. And when we start to think about that, it will change our emotional outlook of life. And out of that um, emotional outlook of life, the application of faith will be bestowed upon you, your family, and other people around you. This quiets our internal emotional storm when we start to focus on that which is good, that which is pure. It quiets the emotional storm. Yes, around you, externally, might be an emotional storm, but you don't have to have an internal storm. When the peace of God guards your emotions and your thoughts, when you start to think about the goodness of God, that will quiet the inner storm in your life. This keeps our focus on Jesus, who is Lord over the storm and Lord over all. I was amazed, and sometimes we, the storm that hit us, was about to hit us, the two storms, Madeline and Lester. I was reading the uh, Hawaii News account and diff different accounts, and the weather apps and everything. It was amazing how the first thing that we do when we hear a storm is calling, is coming, 
is we call upon Mr. Costco at Mr. Sam's Club. And we go right to Mr. Bottled Water thinking that bottled water will solve all our needs. No! You're planting water. And we hog the water. You guys see that? It, it, last few storms, people, instead of taking one case or two cases, they like take the whole crate. I want to slap them and say, are you a Christian? I hope that's for na- your neighborhood and not just for yourself. <laughs> I think that I don't say that. And most times, all of a sudden, when the storm comes, who do we think about? Ourselves. And not anybody else. We think about our comfort, our need. Lord, I better have enough Spam and Vienna sausage. I got to fill my trunk with bottled water. I got to get enough rice and footy cocky on top. No! We focus on it. I guess I'm hungry. And that's why I'm talking about food. Think on that which is excellent. Think on that which is of a good report. Think about his goodness, his grace. If anything is worthy of praise, think about these things. God is working in your life. So that should be a praiseworthy moment that he is there. A focus on the storm can cause the storm to be Lord, even over Jesus. When that predominant thought of that storm, that health issue, that marriage issue, that financial issue, when that becomes the predominant thought, and when you wake up in the morning, it's all you think about, start to think about something good. His grace, his love, his peace. Because then your perspective of life changes. It puts it right side up, not upside down. When the perspective of that storm goes away and says, Lord, you are Lord over all. I thank you for this storm. I may not feel like it right now, but I'm going to thank you for this storm. I'm going to thank you for being Lord of my life. I'm going to thank you for having my life in the palm of your hand as your word says. Think about these things. Do not be anxious. Let the peace of God God guard your heart. Hebrews 12 2 says, look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. The founder and perfecter He is the dispenser of faith. The spirit of faith comes from his throne. But he also perfects our faith. And what's the best place to perfect our faith? Is in the midst of a storm. (laughs) That's how God perfects our faith in him, through storms. And you may not like it, but guess what? That's the reality. That God wants to perfect our faith in him through storms in our life. And lastly, and I am done. Can you believe it? It's my first of five closings. People are getting anxious already. Don't be anxious. Turn to your neighbor. Don't be anxious. Pray for the pastor right now. (laughs) Hear God. Hear God speak and receive faith from him. Hear God speak and receive faith from him. Our response, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, Faith comes from hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ. The word of Christ. The word here means a word specifically spoken in a specific time for a specific purpose. It's a rhema word, not just a logos word from his word, the Holy Bible. But it's a specific word that through prayer, through supplication, through petition, through focusing your eyes and fixing your eyes on Christ, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. A calming word, a word of encouragement, a sense of his peace, a word that leaps off the pages of the Bible and says, that's the word specifically for me in the specific time, in the specific situation to fulfill God's specific purpose in our life. A rhema word. As we keep our focus and continue in prayer, we will hear Jesus speak a specific word to us regarding our specific storm. How many ever watched a movie? That maybe a, a movie uh, where it, it, it's a, a ship that's kind of going through some turmoil or they, lo- they lost power, it could be a warship or whatever it is, a cruise ship. And you've seen, you ever watch those movies and, and the captain is on the radio and he's trying to send a distress signal. You ever, you ever ha- seen movies like that? Okay, you guys watch movies? Okay, get a life. Okay, all right, all right. All right, I know the Dallas Cowboys is all you think about. But there are more things in life, okay? I know Christ is your priority, but you can also go see a movie now and then. 
And so when I watch these TV programs or these movies and the captain and, or the, the, the EXO is on the radio and calling out Mayday or calling out to the other ship for help, it's all crackly and static in, in the line. All right? it's, that, that's like if you have AT&T or Sprint. Okay. <laughs> I have Verizon on the iPhone, baby. Clear. Clear as mud. And sometimes in life, that's what, it, that's what, we, that's what we hear. We hear static. Lord, the storm, I'm calling out to you, but all you hear on the other side is, <laughs> that's all you hear, and your mind grabs a hold of that, but God must be asleep, well, the Bible says he doesn't sleep nor slumber, but yet I feel like he's asleep on the boat, in the back, and I, I'm calling out to him, Lord, all I hear is, <laughs> sometimes in life that happens. But when you petition and when you supplicate and when you pray and you get into his word and you commune with him in his presence and you remember his power, all of a sudden through all of that static comes the Holy Spirit realm of word, that still quiet voice of God that quiets your soul, that quiets your heart, that quiets your spirit. But that can only come when we tune to his voice and we're there in that moment. Okay, God, instead of being chaotic in the cacophony of the storms of noise around me I'm going to tune in right now to your still small voice I'm going to hit the pause button of life and spend time in prayer and spend eight seasons of prayer till I hear that specific rhema word that I know you're speaking to me and all of a sudden through all that <laughs> son daughter I'm here I love it. You guys all just leaned in. <laughs> like, what is he saying? That's how we should be with God. That still, small voice that cuts through all the static of life, the static of fear, the static of anxiety in our life. That word, the rhema word, comes right through all of that and becomes a clear channel to the throne of grace. Can I hear amen? amen. Final scripture. In fact, have the worship team join me on stage. Romans 1.17 it says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This journey that we are in is a journey of faith. We must live by faith and with faith. When you come to Christ and we receive him into your heart, into your life, it's by faith. But that faith moment doesn't stop right there. It is a continual journey of faith to continue to trust him that God is there, that Jesus is there not to harm you, but to give you a hope in the future, to be a God, a blessing in your life. And sometimes in the staticky noise of the storms of life, God is saying, I just want you to be a child of faith. Be a man and woman of faith. Call upon me. And then in that moment, when I know you're ready, I will wake up. I'm seated at the right hand of God, interceding for you, for me. And all I'm asking you is that you would turn your focus, turn your eyes, fix your eyes, fix your eyes on me. And then I will speak. I will pour in my heart, in my love. A little keyboard pad there. And this is the moment. I know some of you are facing storms even right now. And sometimes in this large audience and large congregation, you walk in, you put that smile on, you put your Sunday best on, you put your best flip-flops on. You come to church and you raise your hand, but inside there's an inner storm. God this morning wants to say, turn to me, fix your eyes on me. Let my spirit of faith come into your heart, come into your life, so that when you leave this place, even though the storm might still be present, might still be there, my peace will guard your heart, will guard your emotions, will guard your thoughts when you fix your eyes on me. It's interesting that the disciples had Jesus in their boat, in their life, to rescue them. But maybe, may, may I submit to you this morning... Maybe you might be a good, in a good season of life and you're like a ship sailing on the ocean and it's calm, it's peaceful. 
but you look around you, your family, your friends who don't have Jesus in their boat and they're walking through storms. And your life might be great. You have Jesus in your heart and in your boat of your life. But my submission to you this morning is what about your family? What about your friends who don't have Jesus in their boat? How can they survive the storms of life? How can they, they rise above the waves as we sang here earlier this morning without Jesus in their boat? And the only way that they're going to be able to have Jesus in their boat is through your life, through the words that are proclaimed out of your, your lips, sharing the gospel, demonstrating love in real tangible ways, putting Jesus into their boat or getting them into your boat. I wonder how many people are just drowning in their boats of life on the sea of humanity without Jesus. Can you imagine that? The Bible says in, in that passage of Scripture that other people around that saw what was happening, they were amazed at Jesus. They were amazed at the power that came out of his life, that he was able to bring a great calm in the midst of a great storm. That's what people see in your life. That even in the midst of a great storm, there's a great calm because Jesus is in your boat, is in your boat of your life and your heart. And they want the same thing. And they're asking us, how can I get Jesus? How can I get Jesus into my life, into my heart? That comes from you expressing the gospel, proclaiming the gospel to people around you. Thanks for joining us. Visit our website at pearlside.org for more.